yes, thank you. First of all, let me mention uh, and thank you for working on the initiative to put together this workshop. Uh, and also, in particular, Sim and this group here, or you know, the local organizations, it's really amazing to be here. And uh, I really enjoyed it so far. Uh, okay, so, so I uh, gave this title uh, for the book of abstract. And I'm going to talk about this because of Misha, you know, I advertised that I'm going to talk about uh, the Gatamer race for one of the days. I also to tell you a little bit about uh, this work. Uh, you know, Nisha advertised already. So I'm actually going to uh, start talking about this one uh, and then spend the second half of my talk talking about uh, my original uh, uh So just to give you a sort of the context uh, uh, we're talking about here, uh, talking about with forgotten rays and optic tweezers. So, you know, we think about the elements where people trap the hundred atoms and then rearrange them. Screen sharing. screen sharing doesn't work. That's true. I think you said it. I thought it's sharing. Is it now working? Did you remove this? Yeah, it's okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So, um, setup is we're talking about the uh, Rittberg atom arrays arranged, uh, atom arrays arranged in sort of defect free arrays. In, in our two dimensions. And uh, of course, uh, interesting physics happens here because you can excite these atoms to Rydberg states and uh, realize spin models. And these Rydberg atom arrays, I don't think I have to convince this crowd, but they have an, uh, really a long list of very unique, nice features. They're programmable atom positions, they're scalable, uh, they're very strong and coherent interactions, and they have dynamic in situ sort of. Uh, you know, measurement capabilities, uh, dynamic control and in situ measurement capabilities. And what I'm going to try to convince you is that you can combine these things to do, uh, you know, quantum optimization. Uh, or in the second part of my talk, I will just use the fact that you can also have two species, atom arrays, uh, and with that, uh, do sort of universal quantum computation using only sort of global uh, driving of the atoms. Okay, but just to, uh, you know, uh, sort of fixed notation and concepts here. I'm really talking, uh, all, all I'm going to talk about is sort of with the blockade physics, uh, where we have basically two internal states of these atoms. One is an internal you know, hyperfine state, ground state. One is a highly excited Rydberg state that we're going to couple via a laser with the Rabi frequency omega and the tuning delta. And this will be our you know, two level system with state zero and one. And so sort of the single party Hamiltonian, you know, it's the familiar sort of Rabi Hamiltonian. Uh, but the first interesting physics comes from the Rydberg uh, interaction. So if you have, you know, one atom in, in the ground state, the, atom, the other atom can just undergo Rabi oscillations, you know, you know, described by the single party Hamiltonian. But if you place, you know, the first atom, of course, in the Rydberg state, then you know, if you have two atoms in the Rydberg state, they intera interact by this type of lateral interaction. And, you know, which is strongly distance dependent. And if you bring them close together, you know, within sort of the Rydberg blockade radius, then you cannot excite the second uh, Rydberg excitation. And this is, you know, the celebrated Rydberg blockade effect. And this is basically all I'm going to meet uh, in uh, both parts of this talk. So, you know, just to write it down, this will be sort of the, you know, many body Hamiltonian that we're going to talk about. Um, and it's, of course, you know, uh, tunable in the sense that the laser parameters will be tunable in a time dependent way, via, uh, which you know, allows us to control omega and delta. And the uh, positions of these atoms uh, can be programmed in and sort of realize uh, different types of interaction structure between our atoms, depending on how we place them. Okay, so, you know, as I said, the first part of my talk, I will try to explain you how one can do quantum optimization with these type of capabilities. And uh, when I'm talking about quantum optimization with good per catamarans, it's often very useful to start out to talk about this maximum independent set problem, which was already, already introduced by Misha and also Guerra, uh, uh, talk by Tommaso. Uh, the idea is you have 
sort of you're giving a graph and you're trying to find the largest independent set, which is just a subset of vertices that are not connected on this graph. Uh, for this graph, I color this largest independent set uh, in red. And uh, I formulate this you know, optimization problem as a, as a sort of binary optimization problem by simply associating with each vertex a binary degree of freedom can be either zero or one and writing down this Hamiltonian, uh, which where you can easily see that it has basically two phases. If this theta is negative and this V is positive, then the ground state is the one where all atoms or all vertices are in the zero state uh, because you would pay a price, you know, delta, uh, if, you, if you would sort of flip them to the one state. Uh, but if you make this delta positive, you can actually lower the energy of the Hamiltonian by putting, you know, uh, flipping vertices to the one state. And uh, but you can only lower it as long as you know you, you don't introduce sort of uh, ones on neighboring vertices, which is sort of this independence constraint, because then you would need to pay this price V. So you can see as long as delta is smaller than V, the ground state will be the one that maximizes the numbers of one while satisfying all the blocking constraints or independence constraints. And uh, therefore, the ground state will just encode the maximum independent set of this graph uh, in a sense that you know the vertices that are one form the maximum independent set. And uh, this is uh, sort of very closely related to Rydberg physics, as you see. Sort of, I mean, this is almost the same Hamiltonian that I wrote down before, except the Rabi frequency term. The biggest difference is, of course, that uh, this, uh, in general, this is sort of an interaction that. You know, is given by a graph structure in the Rydberg uh, context. If I sort of think about as associating each vertex uh, with an atom, then this interaction between these atom has, of course, a geometric structure, and I cannot realize arbitrary graphs or the Hamiltonian and arbitrary graphs with this Rydberg blockade mechanism. Uh, but what I can do is I can realize sort of, you know, uh, I can basically realize this Hamiltonian for a specific subclass of graphs. Which are called unit disk graphs. So a unit disk graph is a graph where I uh, place atoms, uh, place vertices on a 2D plane and connect them if and only if the Euclidean distance is uh, smaller than a unit distance. And of course, if I sort of then associate uh, an atom with, with each vertex and the blockade radius with this unit distance, then the Hamiltonian is essentially the one of uh, these Rydberg atom arrays. So for unit disk graph, we can encode this binary optimization problem in the ground state of the Rydberg Hamiltonian with zero overhead by simply, you know, associating one vertex with each atom. Uh, and then you can sort of run a series of quantum algorithms to try to find this ground state. Yeah, I mean, the simplest thing that can come to your mind is you start out here where you can prepare the ground state because you know it. It's actually easy to prepare with all atom in the internal electronic ground state. And then you turn on some Rabi frequency, you sweep your detuning and you turn off your Rabi frequency in the end. If you can do this adiabatically, then you should end up in the ground state here and uh, you can uh, read off the solution here. So this would correspond to the of the following type. You turn on and off your Rabi frequency and you switch your detuning from uh, positive to negative. Of course, there's sort of more sophisticated or less different types of hybrid algorithms where you optimize this sweep profile essentially in a closed loop uh, with sort of the feedback by repeating uh, this sequence several times. Uh, you know, as Misha pointed out, you know, they, we have proposed this now five years ago or so, uh, and then they have done this experiment at Harvard, and I'm not going to uh, tell you about the result in a lot of detail because Misha has done that. What I would like to focus on is how to really go beyond these unit disk graphs. So many problems in, in the real world don't, you know, you know uh, uh, are not formulated naturally in terms of unit disk graphs, even though we heard about something, uh, you know, about, you know, shops in Manhattan that might look like unit disk graphs. In many cases, it's uh, problems are not uh, uh, in unit disk form. And so you might wonder, you know, what can you do with this Rydberg atom arrays uh, in, that, in that case? And sort of we work this thing out here. And the idea here is, well, first of all, we're going from this paradigm of uh, maximum independent sets to uh, something a little bit different, but not very much. It's called maximum weight independent sets. 
So, uh, you know, for each vertex of your graph, you assign a weight, and then you look at the corresponding cost sum here. Uh, in terms of Rutberg atom arrays, this would just, you know, be essentially a local detuning term instead of a global detuning term. But other than that, it's it's pretty much the same. So you want to now maximize the total weight and just, you know, minimize the, the hemi this this uh, energy of this hemicone. And so the first key sort of thing that you want to do if you want to go beyond unit disk graphs is you want to import sort of your vertex or your, or your binary variable that it represents, uh, you know, is represented in a vertex as a, in your problem graph instead of an extended object. And uh, we do this in the following way. Imagine instead of, you know, writing down your atom, you know, representing a vertex, you write down an atom wire or a vertex wire, which has the following sort of the tuning pattern. It's sort of in the bulk, it has two data and at the boundary it has one data. And uh, instead of sort of assigning sort of this binary variable to two configurations of this single vertex, you have sort of, you know, uh, logical configurations, which are these Z2 configurations of this, of this vertex wire, where every other atom is in sort of the root work state. And you can see that these two configurations, uh, if the detuning here is positive, uh, are the you know lowest energy configurations of this wire that they generate, and all other configurations have uh, an energy gap delta above these two uh, logical configurations. So in that sense, these two Z two configurations can be thought of as effective binary degrees of freedom that lives in this wire. Uh, what you then can do is you can give this effective binary degrees of freedom a weight by, like for example, you know. Uh, adjusting the boundary weight of these two boundary vertices, and then you can sort of uh, give an effective weight to this effective degrees of freedom. Uh, with this idea in mind, you can now go and say, well, imagine you want to solve, you know, or you want to encode the maximum weight independent set problem on some sort of arbitrary non-unit disk graph uh, into sort of a Rydberg atom array. How do you do that? Well, you take this graph for each of these vertices, you write down a wire, or a vertex wire. Each wire, you know, corresponds to some vertex and hosts sort of effective degrees of freedom that represent the you know, binary degree of freedom associated with each original vertex. And then you redraw it a little bit, okay, like this, such that each uh, vertex wire uh, process each other vertex wire in exactly one point. So, uh, and then you can say, well, you can look at this graph here and say, well, vertex one here should be, you know, connected to vertex two. So I want to connect the vertex wire one to the vertex wire two. So I make here a connection. I introduce an independence constraint between those the two effective degree of freedom that live on this wire. And then it's not connected to vertex three. So I don't make a connection here. It's connected to vertex two. So I make a connection here and I fill out essentially this, uh, this adjacency matrix here according to, to my original problem. Now you can see that you know you get here something that is almost a unit disk graph, but not quite, uh, because these things here are not uh, of unit disk form. So you use a couple of gadgets to resolve these things. So whenever you have a crossing with an edge, you introduce, uh, you replace these four atoms by this structure, and whenever you have a crossing without an edge, you replace it with this structure, and you can work out the, the replacements. These type of replacements leave the ground state manifold invariant. Okay. And uh, also leave the gap to the higher excited states invariant. In that sense, these uh, you know these are gadgets that you can just you know use to you know replace things here without changing the solution of the Hamiltonian or the optimization problem. And then you end up with a graph which is indeed a unit disk graph manifestly, and uh, you can try to then solve this unit disk graph by doing you know annealing and uh, or whatever is your favorite sort of optimization scheme. And once you have the ground state of this structure, you can immediately read off the solution of this problem here just at the boundary for example. Okay, this is sort of the way to encode you know, independent set problems on, on non-unit disk graphs by mapping them to unit disk graphs. You can do the simi very similar trick and encode sort of Ising problems with all-to-all -all interactions in unit disk graphs, or you can uh, encode arbitrary constraint satisfaction problems uh, into unit disk graphs by using sort of an additional set of gadgets 
Uh, or you can even do other things like uh, encoding an integer factorization problem into a unit disk graph such that uh, the ground state here on this graph you know gives you uh, integer the integer factors of uh, the prime factors of some some integer that you're interested in factoring okay this it's sort of all not surprising that you can do it because the you know maximum independent set problem on uh, unit disk graph is NP complete but it's still kind of interesting that you can find very simple sort of reduction schemes where the overhead is in all cases at most sort of quadratic. Uh, of course, the most interesting question in this context is sort of how does the uh, uh, performance of quantum algorithms, uh, you know, transform if you transform from an original graph to this encoded uh, a unit disk graph. And that's a question we cannot really answer yet. Uh, mainly because uh, so far uh, we have only done calculations on classical computers. And if you sort of perform this mapping from like the original problem to the encoded problem on a classical computer, you have them to solve this encoded problem in the annealing problem on a classical computer. And that's typically a system sizes that are very large. We did this uh, procedure on all sort of graphs uh, that have uh, less or equal than six vertices. Uh, here on this side, of course, then you map them, then the vertex number grows quadratically. Uh, in that case, you can still do it, but uh, and then you can check. So what's the annealing time required for the mapped graph versus the original graph? And you see some sort of correlation, which makes us optimistic. But of course, a serious analysis uh, would be required to see how this really behaves if you go to large and larger system sizes. And uh, that's things that we are working on right now, including trying to see if we can run this uh, on, on a quantum machine. Okay, with this, I'm at the end of the first part of my talk, and I would like to directly move to the second part, uh, which is about universal quantum computation with globally driven good atomized. So the idea here is we want to do universal quantum computation, uh, which, you know, in a circuit model, you all learned in your textbook that what you have is. Uh, uh, register of qubits, and you want to apply a big global unitary, a big unitary on these qubits, and get some sort of output state of psi. So that's basically what the quantum computer has to do. And what you do in a circuit model is you break down this unitary in a you know set of you know in a universal set of gates that can be single or two qubit single and two qubit gates, and then you can write down a circuit and you know execute it and uh, construct your uh, your, you know, output of your quantum computation. Uh, what, you know, people actually, as you saw in, in several of these talks now, as today, Mark, is you can, uh, you know, realize these things with Rydberg atomaries, for example, by encoding these qubits in hyperfine states and then use the Rydberg blockade mechanism to execute two qubit gates. Uh, of course, if you want to uh, run arbitrary quantum circuits, then you need sort of local dynamic control in a sense. You need to know where you want to execute single qubit gates. You need to know where you want to execute the big qubit gates. And Mark Stock really highlighted that very well. You can either do this with local addressing with your lasers or by sort of having dynamic rearrangement and sort of moving atoms in some sort of, you know, zone where you can address them and atoms out of that zone otherwise. So there are different techniques that you know people now pioneer to do this, but I would say locally, you know, dynamic control is still some sort of a challenge. And uh, what I would like to tell you here is that in principle you wouldn't need locally dynamic control. You could also do the entire thing just with global control. And uh, so the idea here is you want to encode the entire circuit, you know, in in a combination of sort of atom arrangements and you know driving pulses that you can make to globally drive the future atomaries. And um, so one of the things that we're going to need is we want to have you know two species of atoms such that we can sort of you know address you know uh, selectively the so species selectively. So in that sense we have uh, some form of control over you know which species of atom we drive. But we will not have any local control other than an initial static placement of the atoms. And uh, so there are a couple of ingredients that are required to sort of understand this uh, setup. So let me just 
walk you uh, through these ingredients one by one and in the end sort of uh, synthesize them to, to this entire picture. So the first most important thing uh, to understand this is uh, what's called quantum wire. So it's just a, a 1D arrangement of atoms where I alternate uh, between atoms of species you know, A and species B. Okay, so A is sort of blue here and B is red. Each of these species has a ground and a Rydberg state, and they can drive in a species selective way, of course, between this ground and Rydberg state. And uh, what I'm going to talk about are sort of what we call standard configurations of this wire. Standard configuration of this wire is a configuration where I have sort of on the left hand side a Z2 order configuration, which means that every second atom is in the Rydberg state, sort of. You know, satisfying this Rydberg, nearest neighbor Rydberg blockade condition. For example, here all my blue atoms are in the Rydberg state, all the red atoms are blockaded. Uh, on the right hand side, all of the atoms are in the ground state, uh, or like in the disordered phase, if you want. And at the interface between those two, you know, domains, I have one atom which can be in a superposition of a ground and a Rydberg state. Okay, and this one atom. Uh, is the one that hosts my you know qubit uh, uh, information okay so this will be this wire will host a single sort of you know qubit uh, of information and it will live at this interface between this d2 order configuration and this disorder configuration so what i'm going to do now with this is i'm going to apply a, you know set of global laser prices and in the simplest case i'm just going to make Sort of pi prices, okay? Pi prices that are, of course, you know, subject to the blockade, nearest neighbor blockade constraint, meaning that I'm going to flip the state of an atom from the ground state to the Rydberg state, or vice versa, if and only if uh, both its neighbors are not in the Rydberg state. But these are sort of the prices that I can easily make. And imagine I'm in this configuration and I make now a pi price uh, on the red atoms. So what happens? All of these red atoms here in the Z2 order configuration, they have neighbors that are in the Rydberg state, so they are frozen and don't evolve. Uh, all the red atoms here on this disordered phase, they uh, can, of course, flip because all of their neighbors are in the ground state. And because I make a pi pass, I flip them all to the Rydberg state. The only sort of non trivial uh, atom here is the one that is to the right of my interface here. You know, depending on whether my interface qubit is in the ground state or the Rydberg state, this uh, red atom here flips its states or not. And you, know, you can easily see that this will produce now an entangled state uh, uh, of, uh, you know, that sits here at the interface. So if the atom was in the ground state, if the interface was in the ground state, the next one will be in the Rydberg state. And if it was in the Rydberg state, the next one will be you know, frozen in the ground state and you have this two atom entangled state. Now, what you do next, is you make a global, you know, pi piles for the blue atoms. What happens now is that all these blue atoms can, you know, rotate and just are de-excited to the ground state. All these blue atoms are frozen because their neighbors are in the Rydberg state. And uh, this atom here, well, if, if it's in the ground state, its neighbor is in the Rydberg state and it will stay in the ground state because of the blockade mechanism. If it's in the Rydberg state, its neighbor is in the ground state, uh, and they can just rotate and flip to the ground state. So this blue atom always goes to the ground state, uh, which leaves this atom here in the superposition of you know Rydberg and ground state. Now, if you make a final uh, high pass that is global for the red atoms, you can see that you will excite all of these red atoms, you will de-excite all of these red atoms, and you will flip the state of this one. Okay, you will change ground to Rydberg and Rydberg to ground so that it actually goes to this state. What we have achieved in this three pi sequence, uh, you know, is in, in, in effect just we we you know still have now a Z2 ordered configuration to the left. We have a disordered configuration to the right, and we have the interface here in exactly the same state as it was before. The only difference is that the interface moved one side to the right. Okay, with this pi sequence, we can move the interface one pi, one side to the right, independent of where it actually sits. So, I mean, in summary, right, if you have some Z2 configuration with an interface, you make this pi sequence, you move it one side to the right. 
first here it is sitting on the blue and afterwards sitting on the red and the time sequence is red blue red now if you want to further move it to the right you have to go uh, blue red blue okay and you can move it to the right and propagate it through the system in a sort of stroboscopic way uh, so if you just continue alternating red and blue pulses, this interface, interface propagates ballistically through this wire. Of course, you can also sort of you know, flip the phase of your pulse sequence and then sort of instead of moving it to the right, you can uh, move it to the left, which will be important later on. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the most important thing, but in end effect, you have a qubit on, an, on this wire and you wanna en enable sort of single and afterwards the two qubit gates that act on these qubits in a, in a way uh, without addressing this this atom here locally. So how can you do that? It's not entirely trivial. One thing that you can very easily do is you can very easily make sort of a single qubit Z operation on this uh, on this interface. How do you do that? Well, you know, if you're in this configuration, you just drive a two pi piles on the blue atoms. Okay, all of these blue atoms do nothing. All of these blue atoms, you know, are in the ground state. They undergo a two pi rotation and pick up a global phase that is irrelevant. Only this atom here picks up uh, a phase of two pi conditional on you know the state of my interface. Okay, uh, so if the interface in the ground is in the ground state, this the wave function picks up a, a sine minus one. If it's in the Rydberg state, it doesn't pick up uh, a sign. Uh, so therefore, it's equivalent. To making a Z gate on my interface qubit. Okay, if I make a global two pi Z pulse on the atoms where the interface is not located, then I can make, uh, you know, Z operation on on my qubit. Uh, but of course, the operations are not enough. What you really want to do is sort of arbitrizing the qubit rotations, and the way to do that is uh, you introduce this uh, what we call super atom or atom clusters. So at some points in this wire, we're going to replace you know, one of the atoms by a pair of atoms, okay? A pair of atoms act exactly the same as a single atom in a sense that it's effectively a two level system. So you have a single atom has a ground state and a Rydberg state, and you can only excite it to the Rydberg state if the neighbors are both in the ground state. This pair of atoms has sort of a, you know ground state, which means that both atoms are in the ground state. Then it has one other state that you can couple it to with the global laser, which is the symmetric superposition of you know one Rydberg excitation in this atom pair. And the, uh, you can you know drive this transition only if both neighbors are in the ground state. Of course, in that sense, it behaves exactly the same as a single atom, except that of course this Rabi frequency here. As a factor squared of two, which is larger than the Rabi frequency here. So this atom in this wire behaves a little bit different. Okay. And this will allow us to do all the magic. So, you know, we just draw a bigger atom because I don't want to draw a lot of balls. Uh, of course, you can also make this super atom not only out of two atoms, but, you know, any sort of number of atoms can be in your cluster. And then you have here some squared of K. Uh, enhancement of the Rabi frequency. And I think for pedagogical reasons, we use these four atom clusters in all of the following. Because then the Rabi frequency here is just, you know, a factor too larger than here. That makes things a little bit easier to understand. So uh, if you have now somewhere the super atom in your wire, you already face the problem that if I now want to propagate my interface through my wire, uh, I'm making my alternating pi pulses uh, to propagate it through. But what you can already see, if I make pi pulses with my red atoms, naively they will not act as pi pulses on my red super atoms. So I have to change something in my pi sequence. But it's actually very simple to change your pi sequence, to change your pi pulse in such a way that it acts, in, you can come up with a pi sequence that effectively realizes a pi pulse on my red atoms, but also on my super atoms. You just have to change your pi sequence a little bit. Uh, and uh, but because we have different Rabi frequency, but it's not that hard to figure out what the pi sequence is. And this is sort of an example for one uh, that does it. So you can simultaneously have pulses that act as pi pulses on red 
atoms and superatoms. So all of this propagation story that I said before, you know, goes through in exactly the same way if you use this pi sequence that is a pi pi on both these structures at the same time. Okay, so that's the first thing. Uh, now, I mean, of course, uh, the idea is if you want to have a single cubic gate, what you will do is you will move your interface uh, to a point where you have this, you know, uh, super atom, because there the super atom responds differently to uh, my global laser drive than all the other atoms. In that sense, you can hope that you can, if you can move the interface there, you can do something that affects only the superatom and not everything else. And in this way, you can, you know, enact a local gate on your qubit by leaving everything else untouched. So that's the essential idea. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that, because in the end, we want to have many of these wires that each of them hosts a superatom. And each of these wire, uh, each, each, many of each of these wires hosts a qubit at the interface. And each of these wires might have many sort of super atoms and you want to now be able to uh, execute a gate here on the super atom because it has a different Rabi frequency but you don't want to execute anything you don't want to mess up the thing here and you don't want to mess up the thing here okay but again you can come up with with ways to do that essentially you have to come up with a pi sequence that does the following okay it's a bit tricky you come up with a pi sequence that you know, leaves normal atoms in the, you know, invariant and does something non-trivial on my superatoms. Uh, if I make this pi sequence and I invert it afterwards, I do nothing, obviously, okay? But if I make these pi sequences in, and in the middle, I uh, make, uh, you know, zero table which is, a, you know, as I said before, uh, you know, two pi rotation on my blue atoms, uh, then this will only happen, uh, then this will, you know, this Z rotation will do nothing for the qubits that have, uh, sorry, this, uh, this will have the following effect. So if you have a qubit, you have a qubit that lives not on a superatom, then, you know, this first operation here does nothing. The Z operation, you know, is just a Z byproduct, and last operation does nothing and just inverts the first one uh, because V and Z sort of commute on normal atoms. But uh, if if you are here, then uh, the Z operation does nothing because the Z operation only affects qubits at the interface, and therefore, uh, for this superatom, you invert the the red piles that is non-trivial on the superatom here. Uh, but if your qubit lives at the superatom, then of course, uh, what happens is the first V operation does something non trivial on this qubit. Uh, then you have the Pauli Z operation, and then you sort of invert this non trivial thing, but it no longer commutes with Z, and you make a non trivial unitary at the qubit that lives on the superatom. That's kind of how you signal out uh, which qubits in which, in which wire you want to execute. Uh, this uh, single qubit rotation. It's a little bit non-trivial, but if you work out the math, uh, it actually works. And this is, for example, the pi sequence that you know does this if you want to, uh, uh, you know, execute the Hadamard gate on, on a single qubit that lives on this uh, superatom. What you now also want to do if you want to build sort of a universal quantum computer is you want to make two qubit gates between sort of qubits that use sort of interfaces of different wires. And the idea is you insert here uh, another superatom, and now and this is actually very simple. If you have two, uh, if you, you move the interface uh, to this, you know, next to this uh, superatom, and what you then do is you make a global uh, two pi rotation uh, on that is a two pi rotation both on atoms and superatoms. Uh, and uh, what happens then is, of course, all of these things just pick up a global phase. All of these things do nothing. Uh, this is blockaded. This just gives you a global phase. The only non trivial evolution that you get is from here, where this atom here picks up a global phase, a phase if and only if both its neighbors are in the ground state. So, therefore, your wave function just, you know, uh, picks up a phase that is equivalent to applying a conditional phase gate. Uh, between those two uh, 
interface qubits. And uh, you can, of course, you know, come up with a pi sequence that does exactly this. I mean, superatoms and atoms, again, have a slightly different drug frequency. So you have to, you know, design your piles that does this, uh, but it's actually very simple to come up with pi sequences. So in this way, you can make single and two qubit gates. The only thing that is left for sort of a universal quantum computer is that you have to be able to initialize your wires in your standard configuration. And you can also do that by simply making sort of putting a super atom here at the boundary. And then you can, you know, simply put all the atoms in the ground state initially, and then come up with a pi sequence that I'm not going to discuss here, uh, that basically gets this whole propagation sequence going. Okay, you can you can work this out, and exactly what happens is you get this propagation sequence going with all the interfaces initialized in the logical zero gate. And uh, so, in that sense, you know, I hope I've convinced you that you have every ingredient to basically translate any you know quantum circuit in just a, you know arrangement of atoms, and then you just globally drive the whole thing with an alternating pi sequence. Okay, in this in this formulation, uh, it seems like uh, your the number of atoms has to sort of increase with the circuit depth. It's actually not true. You can do something a little bit more clever. You can have a universal arrangement of atoms where which is actually completely independent of the circuit, where in each wire you have essentially an isolated point where you can make single qubit gate, and you have an isolated point where you can make two qubit gates, and you just move the interface left and right you know to the point where you want to sort of execute gates so that you can always do by just making appropriate pi sequence as we saw before you can move the interface left and right you just move it to the place where you want to make the next gate and in this way you can sort of uh, translate any quantum circuit here into an arrangement any quantum circuit and n qubits into an arrangement of n squared atoms and then enact sort of the circuit with sort of an order n times p pisces. Okay, I'm already out of time. I hope I've convinced you that you can do a lot of things, a lot of interesting things by just placing atoms in the way you want and then globally drive them. Uh, one of the examples that I gave was how you can do quantum optimization with that type of framework. Another one is you know how to do quantum computation. Of course, these are only two things. I think there's many more interesting things with that. I saw and thank you for your attention. We have less time for questions, but we still have time for questions. Over there, Max is there. Oh, that's so interesting. I mean, I like this way we want to drive it very fast. That's so interesting. You didn't actually read it. Oh, yeah. Read out is actually very simple. You can read out in the computational basis by just measuring in the in, in you know ground truth basis here because your quantum information is you know where your interface is you read it out if this is in the ground state it corresponds to a measurement of the qubit being in the ground state if you find it in a root state it's it's in a root state it's a very simple readout and if you want to read out in a different basis you just have to make a single qubit gate before so it's so just the conventional graphics read out is working in the future way to work yeah, but um, yeah, readout works exactly like in every other piece of experiment. Yeah, a long time ago, I'm going to look at it. Uh, this is not using any point schemes when you need to point it out to my own. You still have a little delay for it. That's all I get. I don't talk about it in the context of rigorous. I'm not aware of your question. But uh, from what you say, you basically have. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I think what I wanted to show is what was not what was surprising to me is that you can do it without any sort of rearrangement, any just like one static arrangement that is independent of the circuit that you want to connect. Just literally, you can like put your atoms there once forever. If you think about a different platform where you don't have atoms, you just have a process that looks the same every time, and then you just globally drive. Yeah. 
I would like to buy the actual world Mark? With this global team, can you, in principle, do the error correction if you have not the issues? Well, of course, I mean, it's a sort of more technical principle that we have here, and it's basically possible that the thing is not here. Uh, of course, that they are regularly active. And these are very wasteful in terms of the but you know, a lot of happens in the report says, and when I totally understand that you might not want to do it exactly this way, it's really more of a good principle. But that's a, a lot of the waste here is sort of uh, in and the that is a classic error. Also, we all had a high operation, you know, we don't carry on. And if you know we say that it's other space. So you can think about here, you can find the good example, we set all the new errors locally, and then you correct all the errors in the world. In the next sort of set all the errors in the world. Yeah, but it's not that easy. Yeah, but it's not that easy. 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 You are like up to the line of this type of thing with error correction or sort of error so that you have any things that you actually have to have to And then you have to think probably if you want to really do the outlook of the code, you're going to have to do it with some sort of evidence. Yeah, you have to do it with some sort of evidence in the form of an error correction or community. And in that sense, in principle, it's possible. How realistic it is, it's a different story, and we honestly do it with that. Two questions. Uh, yeah. So I did uh, one question from your last part. So yeah. when you were including in these wires, it's in the uh, matrix. So, uh, are you increasing their robustness in some sense or, or they becoming more big over there? I mean, that's, uh, I, I don't think it's in some sense, you increase the bargaining and values that are protecting where you could use the traffic and the main model. You need wire, you can use the majority model and say, well, you use this now, and not use the other one. I mean, that's an inclusive model about that. I think that's not really how it works. It's much more than you open up to, you know, movie patterns, something where you can see. If you're really unhappy with some of the very few memoirs, then uh, that's a bit more of a problem than you But that's different my opinion. We looked at it a little bit, and I think that's more of a problem than us. I don't see any urgent question, and we have taken almost three minutes already from your coffee. So let's thank uh, Hannes and Mark again.